So this morning, uh, our scripture passage comes from the Gospel of Mark, um, and it is Mark's telling um, of the Last Supper, which of course is this last meal um, at Passover time that Jesus shares um, with his disciples um, before he is actually arrested the next and actually executed on the next day. So this is typically something we may use on like a Monday, Thursday, or a Good Friday sermon, um, but it fits in with what we've been doing because we've been talking about all these different places uh, where Jesus eats with people, um, and obviously we can't leave this one out. Um, So now we have probably an idea in our head uh, a little bit of what this may have looked like, Um, and thanks to, you know, depictions like this one, um, you know, we we get this thought of of what it might have been like for them to gather um, together, Um, and as of course is uh, usually the case in artistic descriptions, this one gets it almost completely wrong. Sorry, Da Vinci. It's Da Vinci, right? It was Da Vinci? Nobody knows either? Good, then it was. All right. Um, you know, well, a couple things to note, though. We can honestly tell this is one of the earlier depictions of the Last Supper uh, because an interesting thing happened through the centuries. Um, in the later depictions of the Last Supper, there's far more food on the table. So if you get into later works, especially like 16th, 17th, and 18th century works uh, where they paint the, the, the Last Supper, they just can't help themselves. They just paint more and more and more food. Um, But the earliest depictions, of which this is actually not one, some of the earliest depictions have actually very little on the table because, frankly, there probably wasn't all that much in the first place. Um, Two, I don't have any idea why you would all gather around one side of the table. I... I just, I just don't know why that would happen. Um, nobody's taking a picture, right? There's no iPhones, right? So uh, I'm not sure. Uh, and finally, uh, there's an interesting line in Mark's gospel uh, where it says when they had all basically taken their places. Um, in, uh, in the time and in the culture, uh, this actually would have meant that they all took their places, which means they were probably assuming that sort of reclining position to eat that we talked about um, a couple of weeks ago um, at another one of Mark's stories about eating. If you remember when, uh, they, when Jesus ate with the sinners and the tax collectors, um, it said he sat with them, uh, with, with the more accurate translation probably being he reclined with them. So this was a very familiar familiar meal. It was a very, it was a meal between him and his friends, um, and uh, it, it would have been done in the way of the time. So, you know, while this is a nice picture to have in our brain, um, it, it probably didn't look like this. Now, uh, a couple of important things happen here. Um, obviously, the institution of the Last Supper, the bread and the wine, and the thing that we come back to all of the time. Um, but there also is, you know, this whole, at the beginning, this, inter- this kind of thing about Jesus talking about the fact that he's going to be betrayed. He has mentioned this before. This is not news to the disciples. They don't want to believe it. They don't want to believe that anything bad's going to happen. They don't want to believe that they're going to be able to do anything other than keep doing what they've been doing. Um, But Jesus uh, keeps telling them that this is, in fact, going to be the case. And now he's getting rather emphatic about it. He's like, no, no, really, really, right now. Um, And if you look in your Bible um, at this passage, at what happens just before this, the verses literally just before the ones we 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 read, are the verses of Judas going to the people in authority and offering up Jesus in return for money. So the betrayal is not only going to happen, it is already in motion. Jesus knows that because, well, he's Jesus and he knows things. Um, and, 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 And so he brings that up at the beginning before they break bread and share the wine. Now, um, I want to set this aside for just a minute um, and talk about something else. Um, I have a passion for many things, including many esoteric things, uh, and one of the things that I have a passion for is demographics, and I know you're really excited to hear that this morning. Um, We actually have, as a church, a a tool that's actually provided to us by the denomination, and in that tool, we can actually run reports on the demographics of our area, Um, and for a couple of reasons, I've actually been doing that um, recently. So uh, this is a map, and the little green thing you see shaded in the middle there is the the people who live within a 15-minute drive of this building. So that's considered a significant area. If you don't know this, um, they've done studies, and people will basically drive as far to church as they drive to the grocery store. True fact. Now, I'm, obviously, Hayes is pretty close, so we had to go a little further than that. Um, 
Uh, but 15 minutes is a good number. Um, and once you've kind of defined this area, you can run all kinds of reports on it. Uh, big surprise, this part of the world is growing significantly. If you didn't know that, I don't know how to help you because um, it's fairly obvious. Um, and, uh, and, and there's a lot going on. Now, because this tool is really neat and robust, uh, one thing they can do is they can see kind of demographically who lives in this area, you know, what their ages are, what their, you know, incomes are. They see all kinds of stuff. What this system knows about you is scary. Just throwing that out there. It is, uh, because we all exist in databases somewhere, and they've all collected all this information on us because somewhere along the way we gave it all away. Um, but we're going to use it for good, not just to, you know, sell cars and TVs and what everybody else does with the data. <laughs> Um, so one of the things that they have done, this, the, the system has done that, um, that is kind of neat for us, is they've correlated the data about who lives in the community and then some survey work that was done several years ago, or, or just a few years ago, actually in 2017, that was very, very thorough um, about people's opinions, opinions about religion and all that kind of stuff. And so one of the things that they can tell us is um, the reasons um, why people like the people in our area don't go to church. So here are the top four. And I've got a PowerPoint slide. Now you're super excited. <laughs> All right. So I want to talk about these, and we're going to talk, and it, it will relate to the scripture, um, you know, I, I promise, but I find it interesting. Um, and, and I know this, so now you all get to know it too. Um, all right, so these are the top four. Well, it's actually the top six. I combined a couple of them uh, just to make sense. Um, but the top, the, the, the number four on our list is uh, people don't trust religious leaders. Well, fooey. Uh, <laughs> What's not to trust, <laughs> right? Um, but but it's true. I mean, people don't trust religious leaders, and 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 if I had to be, if I had to have a guess about this, um, and not to throw some of my other colleagues under the bus, um, but but the truth is, uh, there has been times and places uh, where religious leaders, and especially people who you know are are silly enough to want to stand in front like I do, um, really have adopted the more the role of Pharisee um, than Jesus. Um, and, and I think, I, I hope you can see that. I know oftentimes we talk about the Pharisees and the religious leaders in here and the kind of things that they do um, and the kind of things that they try to impose on other people. Um, and, and it's a short walk from there um, to, to what some people have chosen to do um, in the name of Christ even today. Um, this, somehow becoming a Pharisee just seems to be a natural part of human life. Um, and it really, we really have to work hard um, to avoid it. One of the things that uh, was made clear to me when I was in seminary and going through the process to become a pastor was this idea um, that the role of a pastor is a role that is sort of set apart, right? It's a different role in the community than others, um, but not set above. Uh, and, and it's something I remind myself of and something you all remind me of from time to time. <laughs> and I appreciate it. Keep me humble. Um, um, but they don't, I mean, and they don't. And, and I also think the problem for this is, you know, if you want, like, you know, if you, if you want to see somebody uh, out there in the world, especially like on the news or TV or internet or whatever, you know, talking from the quote unquote Christian perspective, uh, it's not the people who say reasonable things that get invited to do that, right? It's the people who make good TV, right? Who will say sensational things uh, that get invited to do that. Um, so there isn't actually, I, I, on this one, there isn't a lot to do um, other than to first and foremost just kind of dispel any sort of myths um, that your religious leaders, especially this one, were not perfect. And I don't claim, oh. <laughs> Jim, were you suffering under that delusion? Because I don't imagine you probably were, uh, but I hate to burst your bubble. Yes, we are not. Um, we are people who struggle and people who uh, are endeavoring to, to walk in the path in the same way that you all do. Um, and no, when you go to seminary, they don't give you the secret extra chapters to the Bible that explain everything. <laughs> those don't exist. Don't believe anybody who tries to sell you one. Um, so there's this one. So this is one of those things that we have to deal with, and it's one of those things that, that, that I think about um, a lot. I think about, I, I, I do think about how I am in the world and how I choose to be in the world um, and how I put myself out there. Um, and, and I try to do it in a way that doesn't make it look like I think that I'm all that wonderful or special, because all I have to do is go home to my family and they will remind me I am not wonderful <laughs> or special. Um, and, that, and my wife is laughing at that right now. Um, my daughter is ignoring me uh, and my son is... Uh, <laughs> Literally, this is what's happening. Okay. Um, 
So we have this one, and this is just one of those things that you kind of have to overcome, and this is one of those things that, you know, if you do step up into leadership, you have to think about, um, you know, about how you are in the world and what that looks like, because um, th- these are forces that exist. All right, so the next one, the number three is uh, church wasn't relevant to my life. Now, I think and I assume when they say relevant, um, they don't nece- that we're not necessarily talking about things that are hip and cool, because if we're relying on that with me up here, we're in trouble right? I am not going to be famous on TikTok, and probably most of you are not either. Maybe some of our younger people. I mean, I know there's pastors who try, um, and some of them apparently do a good job, uh, but that ain't my life. Um, But when I think when they talk about this idea of church being relevant, uh, we mean something different, and I think we mean relevant in the way that Jesus was relevant in his time. Uh, If you look at the life and ministry of Jesus and what he did, especially when he was interacting with people out in the world, yes, he taught with them, yes, he educated them, yes, he prayed for them, uh, but he also did other things. Uh, When people were hungry, he fed them. We talked about that last week, right? right? And he didn't feed them in the beginning, he fed them at the end when they were actually hungry, right? But how did that passage from last week start? It said, what did he do first? He healed the sick, right? He looked out in the world, he saw the cares and concerns that were around him, and he took the opportunity to address those in the way that he could. He was relevant to them in that moment, because frankly, when you are hungry, there's probably nothing more relevant in your life than a sandwich or bread and fish right? So relevant, I think, is in the way that Jesus was relevant. Um, And as I was thinking through this story, um, uh, uh, this part of the story and this thing, I was thinking about our own lives um, and really uh, what kind of brought us, my wife and I, um, back to the church. And like many people, um, it happened to coincide with the birth of our first child, Gavin. There he is. Aww. Yeah. (laughs) If you look at him now, you won't believe it, but he didn't have any hair on his head until he was two years old. All right. Um, so when, around the time Gavin was born, um, I had actually found a way. I had wandered my way back into church life um, a little bit. It's something I had some residual from from growing up in the church. And so I had found my way back, and my wife absolutely loved it because it meant I got out of the house on Sunday morning and she could sleep in and I had something to do and wasn't rattling around the house. So I had, this was kind of our practice for a while, for a couple of years. Um, I had been going to church um, pretty much by myself, uh, you know, and, which was fine, and I'd met some people. Um, and then around about this time, uh, we got pregnant with our first child. And, and the people that I got to know, um, uh, you know this being one of them, uh, but there's a group of people that I got to know and kind of hung out with a little bit, came to us one day uh, in, in July and said, hey, we'd like to throw a baby shower um, for you and your wife. And we're like, oh, okay, that would be great. Yeah, she should probably be there. She's doing the hard work on this one. Um, and so they did, and they, they came, and they threw us a baby shower, and they had nice stuff for us, and you know, all that kind of stuff, and they gave us this huge mountain of diapers that I thought would last forever. Oh, <laughs> oh, how naive. Um, um, and, and they were very nice and genuine, and they were good people, and, they, and, and some of them had actually not met Dane before, and so they did. Um, and and so, we, we, so we went there, and that was, we had this great time. And so the next Sunday, uh, Dane's like, well, I should probably go so I could say thank you to folks. And I'm like, sure. Um, and so she came to church this morning, we said thank you to folks. Um, and then in that intervening week, um, Gavin was actually born. Um, and uh, so Gavin, Gavin was born, and so the following Sunday, it's like, well, we got to go, and we got to take the kid, right? I mean, we got to show the kid off, um, and of course, the thing happens that happens to babies sometimes in churches where you get to the door of the church, and then the baby, like, disappears for a while, right? Like, uh, some of, one, of the, one of the friends came and took the baby, and then Gavin was gone, and then he was over there, and then we just watched throughout the service as he kind of moved his way through the different tables, because we sat at tables in that place, um, and around, and all that kind of stuff, and only finally came back to us when he needed a diaper change, because, of course. Um, and, of course, my wife came with me every Sunday thereafter, and so did my baby, and they were very excited to see the baby and somewhat excited to see us. That church, without meaning to, that group of people, I don't know that this was intentional by their parts at all. They were simply doing what they knew that they needed to do. They were simply trying to be nice to us and bless us in that way um, that people as part of a community like to try to do. But the truth is, what they were really doing is that was a community that came around us and became relevant to us in a very important way at a time in our lives 
when my wife and I were going through this process of going, oh my God, they're going to let us leave this hospital with this child. These people are insane. We have no idea what we're doing. Neither one of us babysat. Neither of us had any idea what to do with a kid. That one hour class they make you take is a joke. Sorry. <laughs> All we knew how to do was put him into the car seat and no idea what to do with him once he came out of it. And that community of friends that was around us, most of them had kids older than us, most of them uh, who had other things, who had been there before, who had already were parents, some of them grandparents, came around us and surrounded us in a way that was relevant in a way that really I don't know could have been done any other way. When we talk about the church not being relevant or the church being relevant, I think that's what we mean. I think that's the thing we want people to have. We want people to know when they come to us and they share something going on with us and we say, can I pray for you, that, that they can know and trust that we're going to pray for them. And then we're going to bring them a casserole because we're Methodists and that's what we do. <laughs> so and I think sometimes my heart kind of breaks sometimes when I hear that, like, well, I don't think the church was relevant. And then what that tells me is that you, you were not in a place where, you, where people came around you and surrounded you with the love that I have felt in this place. And my hope for them would always be, I hope you can find a place like that. I hope you can find a place that does that and is that way, because that's who we're called to be, because that's what Jesus did. Jesus came around people and loved them, and so we do the same thing. We come around people and love them. All right, so number two, we're getting to the top two. Religion is too focused on money. Well, we do have bills. We do have bills as a church, um, and, but I don't think that's what they mean by this one either. Um, so again, if you do a, a Google search, and you probably shouldn't, but if you do a Google search on pastor private jet, lots comes up. We don't have a private jet here, nor am I asking for one, FYI. Uh, but when people see things like this, right? I mean, when people, when, when this is what's out there in the world about what church is or what church cares about, um, and Pastor Alec is like, you know, says that Jesus will come back faster if you give. And basically, if you buy me a private jet, Jesus is going to come back faster. And I'm like, uh, I'm not so sure. I don't think so. Um, you know, um, and, and, and the truth is the church does usually have to be, you know, the, the church uh, has an interesting relationship and, and oftentimes has some interesting challenges unique to it uh, when it comes to things like money. Um, now, what's interesting, this passage today, this exact passage today, the institution of the Last Supper, one of the sacraments, one of those things we come back to um, uh, at the beginning uh, over and over again, is actually preceded by two passages that are really about money. First, we have Judas. We have a Judas agreeing to betray Jesus for money. And then right before that, really honestly, standing in contrast to that, if you look, it's the woman. If you know the story, there's a woman who's with Jesus at a dinner, and she breaks open a jar of really expensive perfume, and, he, and she offers it to Jesus. And the disciples take exception to this uh, because they think it could have been used in a different way. And then Jesus says, no, this woman did the right thing. Now, that whole story deserves a whole sermon by itself, and I'm going to add it to the schedules. We're not, we can't get too far down that path because it's a whole other thing. Uh, but really what Jesus is saying, the saying to this, that person in that moment is, when we are using our resources, when we're using what we have to love God, love neighbor, and love ourselves, then we're doing the right thing. And what she's saying, what she's saying, what, she's, what he says in that moment is this woman is doing this thing to love God. And he knows that he's not going to be around much longer, right? That's really the crux of the story. Jesus knows he's not going to be around much longer in this way, that the opportunity to do things like this is going away, right? So she's like, no, he's like, no, she did the right thing because she's not going to be able to do this for much longer. She's not going to be able to show her love for Christ, her love to God this way for much longer. She's going to have to do it a different way soon. Because that thing that I keep telling you is going to happen, you don't want to believe is going to happen, is actually going to happen. So I think sometimes uh, when, when people get caught up about this, it's not the fact that we do have to ask you all for funds, because we do, because we have a nice building and the lights are on and I like a paycheck, sorry. So do the other people who work here. But it's not about that. But the point is, all of that is also should be for a purpose. All of that is not to build um, some amazing monument to us all of those resources that we expend in this place should be used and need to be used and have to be used so that we can practice the love of God, neighbor, and self, and so that we can help others learn to practice the love of God, neighbor, and self. And so long as we are doing that, then we are using our, our resources 
in a responsible way. If we're not, then people have the right to wonder about it. All right, so then the final one, the number one reason why people don't come to church. Who's surprised? (laughs) Religious people are too judgmental. So this kind of goes to the heart of the story today that I want to talk about. First off, it is not that there is not right and wrong. There is. It is not that there are it's not that there are, the right, there, there are right ways to be in the world and wrong ways to be in the world. It is not um, that sin does not exist. It is not any of those things. That is not what I'm saying and never would say. One of the most interesting, two of the most interesting classes I took in seminary were actually Christian ethics classes. Um, and, and really, we would debate all sorts of things and all kinds of things all the time and what's right and what's wrong and, and all sorts of things. And they get fun and they get academic and you sometimes lose friends. You do. Um, when, uh, yeah, uh, there's some interesting ideas out there. Um, it's not that. However, all of that said, that that is true. Look at to where we are in this story. Right before the institution of the Last Supper, Judas agrees to betray Jesus. Jesus then gathers with all of his friends, his 12, the loyal people who have been with them. He reclines with them. He breaks bread with them. He talks about the fact that the one who's going to betray me is the one I'm literally dipping my hand in the same bowl with. And in the days of COVID, we know how intimate an act that is. Right? They didn't sanitize between their dipping. Jesus says that's who it is. And then he takes bread and says, this is my body that I'm going to hand over, not for my benefit, but for yours. And then he takes the cup. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant, the new covenant that I'm making with you and everybody. A covenant that says, I'm going to do this and you're going to do that. A covenant that says, love of God, neighbor, and self are going to be the most important thing. And he hands that cup around. And Judas is still there. He is one of the twelve. He takes the bread, he receives it, and he passes it on. He takes the cup, and he receives it, and he passes it on. None of us, living in that world, knowing that that happened, knowing that Jesus didn't even exclude Judas from that time and that opportunity, knowing full well everything that had transpired and everything that would, How can any of us exclude people from God's love and God's grace and the opportunity to know it? Absolutely. It is each of our responsibilities to accept the love and the grace that we are being offered. It is absolutely our responsibility uh, to make sure uh, that we know how God wants us to live and that we are doing everything we can to live in that way. But what we cannot do is say automatically, by this, that, or other criteria that you don't get to know or you don't have the opportunity to know God's love and grace. And we don't get to say that because Judas was at the table and Judas received in the same way that we are all invited to receive. Now, finally, one of the things that I, want to sh- that I found interesting also Um, in this list of the top reasons why people don't go to church. What was far down the list, far below anything that we shared today, down the list for the reasons people gave is this one. It's not that people don't believe in God. It's not that people don't believe in God. For the people in this area, the people that we run into most of the time, and the people you encounter at the grocery store and all that sort of stuff, that isn't the biggest stumbling block, though sometimes I think it is. Sometimes we'd like to think it is. It's not that. It's a stumbling block for some. It's not that this isn't a reason, but it isn't the biggest reason, and it isn't the most important reason, which is great for us in some ways, because all the rest of that stuff, we do get to have some control over. We get to have some control over who we invite in. We get to have some control over how we use our resources. We get to have some control over, um, you know, how we are relevant to one another and how we love one another. And yes, to some degree, you get to have some control over me as your religious leader, Jeremy, stop doing that. No, just whatever. Whatever. So, that, <laughs> I'm loving the delayed reaction laugh back there, Jana. That's great. 
Jada, Jada monitors the live stream, so she's about four seconds behind all of us most of the time, just in case you needed to know that, which you didn't. Okay. Um, <laughs> so here we are at this moment, at Jesus' last meal. That's really what this is. It's not just the Last Supper with the disciples. It's Jesus' last meal before everything else is going to happen. And we're reading about it, and we're talking about it in the Gospel of Mark. If you remember, Jesus had a first meal in the Gospel of Mark, and it's how we started this worship series. In that first meal in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is eating with the sinners and the tax collectors. In the last meal, he's eating with his 12 closest friends, and he's still sitting with sinners and tax collectors. And yet he's there. And yet the bread is broken and offered. And yet the wine is poured into the cup and the cup is passed around. Because that's how much God's grace is. And that's how far Jesus is willing to go. So in the United Methodist Church, we practice what is known, and we always have, uh, as far as I know, uh, we've always had practiced open communion, open, the open table, which means anybody and everybody, and I say it every time we do this, anybody and everybody is welcome forward. And you're welcome forward, not because you're great and not because you're wonderful, though some of you are, not all. No, you're all pretty wonderful. I didn't look over here when I said that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that's not the reason why. The reason why is no matter how much we know we've messed up, no matter how far, far fallen short we have, no matter how many times that we know that we have sinned, how many times we know that we have done the wrong thing, it doesn't matter because, you know what, if Judas was at the table, then God wants us at that table too. God wants us to physically touch and taste the grace and love that is available to us. And then God hopes as I hope that we will all make the choice to start trusting a little bit more into that love and grace. Let going a little bit more of the things that we don't have control over. Reminding ourselves of those things that we do. And because of the love of the grace we find at this table, may we all be a little bit more relevant to our neighbors, relevant to our family, and relevant to ourselves. Because that's who we are in the church. That's what we care about. We need to know that. And the world needs to know it. Amen.